Welcome again to the Herbal Spot, our podcast where we interview exciting individuals working in the fields of ethnobotany, conservation, and generally um, on making a contribution in sharing knowledge about our botanical spaces and the people who are so important. And uh, today we have our special guests, all of our guests are special, but I'm extremely pleased to have Maria Fadiman sitting in the spot with us today. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, I'm really excited to be here. So I'm going to, Maria, read a bit of your bio. Uh, which is fascinating in itself. And we're going to get straight into our discussion today. Maria is a professor in the Department of Geosciences at Florida Atlantic University, a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, two times TEDx speaker, and a fellow in the Explorers Club. She researches the human environmental aspect of conservation throughout the globe, focusing on the ethnobotany of the rainforests of Latin America and the savannas in Africa. In addition to her scholarly publications, she is one of the invited contributors to the book Global Chorus, along with Jane Goodall and the Dalai Lama, among others. She loves public speaking, works as an expert on numerous National Geographic expeditions. She enjoys teaching and won the Excellence and Innovation in the Undergraduate Teaching Award and was twice a finalist for the Distinguished Teacher of the Year Award. She received her PhD in geography at the University of Texas at Austin, an MA in Latin American studies from Tulane University and a BA from Vassar College. Uh, Maria, just reading your bio alone fills me with great excitement. <laughs> um, so let's get straight to it and ask, you how did all of this rich experience um impact on you and uh, led you to focus in on ethnobotany well thank you so much for the introduction and this is this is so important so what what led me to ethnobotany is i always wanted to do conservation and i was also afraid of science and I ended up working in, uh, in a rainforest in Latin America, and I was being trained to be a naturalist guide. And I was learning about how the plants interact, water and the soil and the animals. And I realized, oh, my gosh, this is science. It's like, this is great. I mean, I didn't love all of it. The day the tarantula crawled out of my shoe. <laughs> but, okay, I don't love everything out here. And again, I appreciate <laughs> the role that tarantulas play in the ecosystem. I just personally prefer them not inside my shoes. But I also was always interested in people and culture. And so I'm in this just vibrant, pulsating world of green plants and activity. And I realized it was the people who lived in the forest. They were the ones who were teaching me how the forest works itself and also how they interact with it. And I, I got very clear that if I want to work in conservation of any ecosystem, that I need to include the people who live there as well, that they are part of the, the system as a whole. And when I, when I first was working with ethnobotany and doing this, I was working with medicinal plants, which is really important. And I was in Ecuador going out with a quichua uh, curandero, someone who cures with the plants. And we would go around, we would collect plants, he would tell me what they're used for, and I was making a little a little booklet. And um, one day I had a sore throat, and I was kind of excited because I thought, ooh, he's going to 
give me some plant to use and I'll actually get to utilize what I'm learning. And I said, I, well, you know, I have a little sore throat. And he said, oh, so we'll take some aspirin. It's like, we've got work to do. And I was like, what? And, and of course, aspirin, yes, originally um, came from, from a willow tree and it was indigenous people who knew that knowledge, but that is not the context in which he was suggesting it. And I just realized that for me, I wanted to work with things that I could see and touch really actively being used um, each day. And so I started working with more fiber plants and also food plants. So one of the places where I've concentrated is on palm trees and collecting the fronds to thatch a roof and using the, the inner ribs to weave a basket and collecting the fruit and looking at how sometimes people collect sustainably and sometimes they don't. But just mostly looking at really how people and their identity are so connected to, in this case, the artwork they create or the food that they make mm -hmm. and using using plants to do that. Yeah. So that's how I got into ethnobotany. Uh, that is such a beautiful narrative there. And, you know, the the deeper we um, look when we are working with this within our designated field or the field that we have a passion for, um, invariably you're going to have those beautiful moments and the field of ethnobotany uh, brings uh, these beautiful moments um, frequently. Um, I always um, make mention of the fact that uh, as a natural product chemist, you know, my, my focus was studying molecules and their behaviors in a laboratory setting and uh, I then drifted into looking at natural products and when you begin to look at um, natural products and the sources of these natural products being plants and then you begin to you know see the bigger picture opening up um, it's about plants and people and that is what led me to the Society for Economic Botany no society for ethnobotany and it and you know gave me such enrichment in terms of the perspective of this whole um journey into natural products chemistry uh to the point where i i realized that i had to um make a bigger contribution i am still a chemist at heart but i am totally in support of us understanding the importance of biocultural heritage. Um, anything you would like to add here? Oh, just that that to me is such an important story to tell because I think so many of us start within a discipline that we understand it makes sense to us. And then when other opportunities come, um, sometimes it's hard to say, wait, maybe I don't know how to do that or maybe that isn't relevant to me. And you are such a great example of saying, wait, I can... I can do this and with my skills, I can make that even broader right. and I can include more and have more of a kind of impact that, that you wanted to have. And, and then that's open to all of us. And it takes it takes a little flexibility and a little jiggling around of what perhaps the expectations we had of ourselves. But that's such a great example of what we could all do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's something I think that is um, sort of a, a natural evolution especially when you bring that passion behind it. Uh, I think that passion pushes you um, to look for a deeper story. And um, invariably, then it blossoms into something that is extremely exciting. Uh, I want to mm. talk a little bit about you being a National Geographic Explorer. You know, as, as a, a young child or person um, where your source of such exploration is a television screen. <laughs> um, and to know that you, Maria, are living those experiences um, on a, um, if not a daily basis, um, a yearly basis. Um, tell me about, you know, how you feel being about um, part of National Geographic. Well, it's really exciting, I have to say. And, and how it started, actually, was... I received an email saying, we're not sure if you got our previous email and congratulations, you are a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. And I thought, what? 
<laughs> I thought, did I apply for something and I forgot? <laughs> or they made a mistake. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I don't even know how to go with this. And at the bottom, it had a, a phone number. And so I called the number and they answered, you know, hi, National Geographic. And my heart is pounding. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I said, hi, this is Maria Fatterman. I just got this email. And they said, oh, they said, are you calling to see if it's real? And I said, yes, I am. And they said, it is. And I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh. And um, and then I asked the question, which I, I didn't want to ask because I was still afraid they would say, oh my gosh, we have to check our records. You know, they're the wrong person. And I said, well, how did this happen? And they said, well, you're anonymously nominated. And then if you're chosen, we let you know. And if you're not, you never know you were nominated. Wow. So it was this huge moment. And people often ask me, you know, well, how did you get it? And in this case, I was truly doing what I wanted to do. And as you said, what what was my passion? Mm -hmm. And I was working hard and I believed in it and I wanted to make the world a better place. And it also fills me up. Mm-hmm. And it, and then this wonderful thing happened with that. And something that I do try and communicate to people is, you know, some, some external group like National Geographic, for whom I have so much respect, mm-hmm. um, they might come along, but they may not. But if you're doing what you believe in, that that is really valuable um, in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Having said that, which is all true. It has been really pretty incredible. <laughs> so one of the things that through, through getting to be connected with them is the kind of ethnobotany I do. They're really um, supportive. So I had um, long ago, early on, done a project with the Guayami indigenous people in, um, in Costa Rica in the rainforest. And now actually they're called the Nagabi. And there was a, a woman who was there and she was named Marta, but they used to call her La Enfermita, the little sick one. Mm. And she would walk around kind of crunched over. And one day the villagers all pulled their money so that she could get an appointment with a Western doctor in town. And so they walked that group, they walked through the forest and out through the fields and into the city. And at the end of the day, she came back and she was standing really upright and she said, I have been cured. I said, that's wonderful. And she said, yes. And she opened her hands and there in a crumpled plastic bag uh, were six ibuprofen. Whoa. And so, she, right. So she had painkillers that would last mm. her maybe, maybe till the end of the day. And I, I didn't know what to say. And I kind of started to walk away and her sister came up to me and she said, you know, Maria, she said, our father used to know how to cure from the forest. Mm-hmm. She said, but we don't know how anymore. So one of the things that that I do that National Geographic has really helped facilitate is working to record people's knowledge. And the idea is that often people, if they understand their plants and they know they're using their plants and how to, they're more likely to want to conserve them. So it's an internal conservation. And the idea is to create a, a choice so the information is not lost when an elder passes away. And so uh, one of the kinds of projects and just one specific example with National Geographic was working in Tanzania with Grace Gobel, who's another National Geographic Emerging Explorer. And she's from Tanzania and we were working with the Ha people um, and the forest in which they live, all all forests are important. This borders up against um, where Jane Goodall works with her chimps. So it's especially important in that way. And we were working with making a booklet of the useful plants of the community so that they would have a written record of their own uses. And we also really emphasized the tribal language, um, Kiha, so that that would also be be elevated to the point of saying, this is a book that is written in your language. And then second, we had Kiswahili. And then third and lastly, we had English. And so we're working with the elders and we're learning about medicinal plants and plants for cooking and plants for construction and plants, all of these things. And we noticed the little kids are peeking in and looking and trying to hear what we were saying. And we really realized we we want the kids to keep this information alive. 
So we ended up writing another grant. We came back the next year to the adjacent village that had asked us to come. And we worked with the adults on making a booklet. But we also particularly spent time with the kids and we worked with helping guide them and in interviewing their own elders and how to collect plants so that they could record their own information without needing to have anyone like us um, come in at all. And again, this is about choice. They certainly don't have to use any of their own information. And I, I certainly use, use aspirin when that's appropriate. But the idea is they would then have the option um, to be able to be in control of and masters of their own information in their own environment. And, and National Geographic has been very supportive in funding um, projects, that project and various projects like that, that I've done with, with other people. That's super to hear. Um, you know, uh, as I said, National Geographic um, has provided um, a window um, into the world for many of us. And I can only imagine um, how thrilled it must be for you to be part um, of what we see through that window. And it is so vital that um, traditional knowledge is treasured um is documented and uh, you know we be kept within communities and so i love that effort um here at barbados we have um a a growing centenarian population um invariably weekly we are celebrating um a centenarian if not just reaching the 100 year um <sighs> there yeah um, there are oh. 100 and, yeah, 102, 105. We've even had, um, our eldest was 115. And oh, I love it. Yes. <laughs> and um, I, I argue that these are individuals who would have been born um, in the early 1900s and uh, were not, you know, um, able to have a dedicated healthcare system and they've made it over 100 years and that had to be 100 years enriched um, by mm -hmm. traditional knowledge. Uh, it had to be enriched in terms of knowing um, which of our, you know, local plant resources were good for food, um, which of our local plant resources were useful for medicine. Um, and I had the great pleasure of interviewing one of the centenarians and her children did reinforce that. Um, they mentioned to me um, that she started to work on the plantations here in Barbados at nine years old. She uh. then went on to have, I think, 12 children and she raised them all. Um, mm -hmm. Very well. She was also community um, spirited uh, in that she would not want to know that there's anyone or any child within her village that is in need of something that she could provide and she not do so. And uh, they oh. also described that, you know, there are times when she would leave home and on her return, she has a basket loaded with um, many plants of medicinal value. Uh, there were plants, you know, to help them when they're having colds and flu. There were plants that uh, were simply used as tonics, plants to help them sleep well at night. Um, they said that <laughs> that basket really was like a basket of life for her family. Um, and I do yeah. believe, yeah, I do believe that it's that rich tradition um, that led her to having such a... Um, you know, important life. She, I think she lived to about 105 um, and being able to raise her 12 children and, you know, being on the cusp of um, that historical period on the island. As you know, Barbados was um, a, a significant outpost during the period of the transatlantic slave trade. And even mm -hmm. though, you know, the, the proclamation ending um, slavery officially um, that would have lingered um, and even today we would have uh, some of the repercussions um, still permeating our society 
So I value um, our centenarians and uh, I value, you know, any uh, work that is being done to preserve um, these communities and helping them to continue um, sustainably using their knowledge. Oh, absolutely. And I love also these people who are living to these beautiful old age mm. ages um and clearly highly highly dependent on their plants to to help that happen yeah and in doing it just for how how they live and her being able to take care of her children that way too yeah is it's so encouraging you know it shows hey this is this is real <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're such wonderful narratives to me, and um, it it um is inspirational in terms of informing, you know, your your inputs as you continue. Um, I know that mm. you know we're talking about um working within those communities. Um, you noted that you um gave uh, more than one TEDx presentation. Um, what would have inspired, um, you know, your TEDx talks? Um, I don't recall, you know, um, I think I've, I've watched you given a, a, a talk and your talks are always really, um, very poignant for me because I think, um, the strength of Maria, um, is really and truly, um, walking the path and understanding the importance of people and the space in which they're living. Um, and that's mm. that's what I love when I watch and hear you speak. Um, so in terms of your TEDx, what, what were the topics that inspired your presentation? Mm. Well, first of all, thank you for, for saying that. So the first one that I did was inspired by work that I did uh, with a National Geographic group with um, another explorer, David de Rothschild, who organized a group to go to the Amazon and looking at um, oil exploration and its effect on the local people. And he was doing this through art. So he had brought some very well-known artists along and he also brought uh, me and I don't do art. So I was there for, for another, add a different element to it. And so this talk was really about the experience of going into these oil areas that at the time had, they had said that they were cleaned up, but we were looking at open oil pits. And then even working with an oil company that is known for being more environmental. And it is in the effect that it, when you when you bring up oil, um, you, you take the oil, but then there's also water that has oil in it and that's waste. And the most responsible way to handle that is to pump that back down to where the oil came from. Oil is not bad. It's just, it should be where it belongs. And um, so there were these, these oil pits that supposedly weren't there. And then this other oil company talked about how they work with the local indigenous people and the relationship they have. And so we went to the village and it was clearly very influenced by um, working with the oil company that they were living in um, a housing that was not traditional and they had a traditional hut, but it had a tarp over it, which would indicate they weren't patching their own roofs with their own materials. Mm -hmm. And just looking at, at this reality and that there are other groups that live further away that are still living more traditionally. And one of the big takeaways was that this is happening and this is real and this is really important and this affects all of us. And for me to look at my own life as we we took a helicopter in, we, usually I go by canoe, mm -hmm. but National Geographic in this particular instance, we were funded differently. And, but the, of course the helicopters were being run by fossil fuels that we were looking at. So I'd also, yeah. I had to look at my own relationship with, mm -hmm. with what I was studying. Yeah. Um, and so the first TEDx talk was about that. And the second one had to do with um, the Yucatec Maya and the Yucatan in Mexico. And they work with a traditional weaving fiber to make what are called Panama hats. And Panama hats are actually, they were worn in Panama, but they were not woven there. 
and looking at this tradition and they actually weave down inside caves to keep the materials supple and seeing how the ecosystem there you you can they dig their their own caves actually and also looking at how this tradition is shifting as as people are starting to do other things mm -hmm. and again looking at this retention of traditional knowledge and ways of using um, the natural environment and uh, how this is also in flux um and so looking at how to find a balance with with all of that because yeah. it's all important it's important to move ahead and 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 absolutely everyone should have that opportunity and for us not to lose these important ways we have of living with the earth on which we depend yeah yeah um it is uh you know um very special work because a lot of disruption has happened over time um causing you know separation and um, loss of traditional knowledge and i think that the work that you're doing um and others working in the area is um like repairing the links that have been broken and um mm. I, it is yeah it's such a vital um action to be part of i want to um talk a little bit now about uh, education as you are um, recognized for your teaching capacity as well. It's great to hear of you being um, in the Global Chorus book um, with Jane Goodall and we know about her um, in terms of the, the pinnacle of um, field work in all of her work that she's done um, and I'm sure she has inspired many um, persons who were thinking oh. about becoming such a scientist and um, as a young person I, I also followed um, her work um, and I also note that you mentioned that you know you have been intentionally um, working on booklets that would help in the preservation of indigenous knowledge and making sure that the indigenous communities are being armed so um it's like two questions i have here really um one is how important um is it for curriculum development to take another look at how we're teaching science i know there are some areas where they are no longer separating the scientific field into subject areas, but they're uh, teaching science in a more holistic perspective. So what is your opinion on that one? Um, and secondly, how important is it to um, give students that perspective as we respond to the outfall of climate change? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, education is so important. I mean, clearly I'm in it, but even those of us who aren't in it, it is um, something that affects affects all of us. So I think that um, to incorporate the concept of ethnobotany is hugely important, um, simply because we're all we're all connected to plants mm -hmm. and we're all dependent on plants. And a lot of the work I do is out in in rural faraway places that for far away for some people and working in classrooms there with those children is important but also just looking at what we do so for me here in the united states that and, and with my students i i teaching a class right now and we're looking at where we live so when we think of you know what did i have for breakfast if i had toast for breakfast well mm -hmm. that's wheat and that's connected to agriculture mm -hmm. and that is ethnobotany or the clothes that we're wearing. Maybe they're made out of cotton or, or even our house plants. You know, what is inside our home when they're emitting oxygen and ions and that's all good. And they've done so many studies about how they also just make us feel good and, and inspired from Japan, the concept of forest bathing. Yeah. So just getting that ethnobotany is not something that, that's so out there or different. I mean, it's something that we work with um, every day and and also even ritually you know we think oh you know out out in the rainforest they do things well we think well 
what do we do here at the in, in the United States at the end of October? There's a big orange plant, October 31st, and we're all going to take this big pumpkin. <laughs> and we know what we're going to do. We're all we're going to scoop it out. We're going to carve it. We're going to put a candle in it. Yeah. It's going to glow. We're going to put it in front of our house. And then up and down the street will be all these glowing pumpkins. <laughs> and it's very ritualistic. And yeah. if I say, oh, well, I work in the rainforest, so I'm going to carve a snake this year. And I'm going to do it out of a zucchini. <laughs> Can't do that. It has to be a pumpkin. So we're connected to, to that plant <laughs> for, <laughs> for that ceremony for that day. So so just one example of the many that we're we're just connected to plants mm -hmm. in in so many ways. And looking at, so incorporating it into education is just something that we we live every day and, and it's it's such an important thing for us to know. And then also looking at how this connects to to the larger issue of yeah. you know, global environmental change. And um, the way I see it is the more that we understand, frankly, that it's all interconnected and mm -hmm. how specifically we, we depend on these plants, that, that that will promote the possibility of all of us seeing just the effect that we have as we move forward um, in our personal habits or the industries that we support. And it's about making decisions mm -hmm. um, with more knowledge and just an enhanced understanding of how this works, then people can decide that we're not just doing something be because we don't know or we don't realize, but with an increased awareness, we can truly make decisions on what we know mm. and move forward from that point. So I think it is very empowering to have the knowledge to say, hey, this isn't just all out of my control. So there are things that I can do yep. now that I get better how this all works and goes together. Yeah, um, I, I love that um, empowering because I, I share that perspective as well. Uh, it, it is, <laughs> you know, for me, this fundamental um, that we allow our young people to understand um how it is all connected truthfully and um mm. you know as you said arm them so that they themselves can make good decisions as they weave you know their life into um what's happening around them and also global position um in in our nonprofit uh, we recognize the importance of empowerment um and we adopt um, what we may call art as a tool for change. And mm -hmm. one of our outputs that I'm extremely proud of is our um, heritage coloring book. Um, mm -hmm. It's called the Abisi Guada. And uh, that language is the language of um, the indigenous people that were um, initially on the lands in Barbados. And uh, um, because of the... Um, colonial period, you know, mm -hmm. um, they were no longer occupying the lands, but a lot of archaeological work has demonstrated that they were um, important. Um, not that we always need to have them, but it's important, again, to um, offer that evidential experience. And um, mm -hmm. in this book, we have captured the textural beauty of a number of plants of medicinal value. And it is that aspect that we are using to interface with those who will have the book in hand. And uh, the company that we have, Prose, which describes um, features of the plant, um, the biocultural value of the plant, um, mm. and where we can, you know, geographical distribution. Uh, we didn't want it to be a, a technical book. We wanted it to be a tool for reconnection. And we had a beautiful story uh -huh. relayed to us. We have both a junior version and an adult version. And we had a beautiful story relayed to us of a gift of the book that was um, made to an elder um, in a community. And um, she treasured that book so because she said it offered her 
a revisit to her younger years, um, the oh. stories, the narrative, and then just the pleasure of, of drawing, well, not drawing, but the pleasure of coloring um, the imagery that was associated um, just brought her many hours <laughs> of enjoyment. <laughs> and um, that is the, the story that we were hoping would develop. And um, the younger kids are also extremely excited um, to have the opportunity in some cases to learn about plants and fruits that, um, you know, they're no longer connected with because we don't have the same type of foraging when I was a younger person. I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> oh, and I love that it's a coloring book so they can be interactive mm -hmm. with the written material right. and get to be a part of it. And I love it even that the the older woman, that that let her really reconnect with it. So yeah. actually, I just took a quick note. I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. <laughs> Next project. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of the outputs that we really are, are very happy about. Um, you know, our nonprofit um, is what well, we were registered in 2017 and we got our funding from the Global Environment Facility in 2018 and started mm. our work in earnest in 2019. So the nonprofit is still a young nonprofit, but it is important that we see targets uh, being made so that we can measure you know, our value as we develop. And, and that is one that we are especially pleased about. Um, we got support from our National Cultural Foundation as well. And um, quite a few partners came on board because I think everybody understood that this is an important contribution. And it's the first in a series that we hope to produce as well. Oh, I love it. And just, and congratulations. Not oh, only for you. creating your nonprofit, but 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 having a direct outputs, and that's yeah. that takes a lot. That's impressive, and clearly, it was also during COVID time that you were really making things happen. So, yeah, yeah I'm impressed, right. and I love it that that's out there. <laughs> yeah. So maybe um, Maria, we can collaborate on something because um, you know we are focused right now on Barbados and the Caribbean, but we obviously want to um, have a global perspective as well. Um, so it's an offer I'm making to you. <laughs> that maybe... I would love that. <laughs> I would be honored. Great. Absolutely honored. And we can really make something happen. <laughs> okay. Well, this is something that we will work on. Um, I want to really thank you for taking the time, uh, Maria. I, you are uh, so engaging. Uh, and that smile. <laughs> which our <laughs> listeners will see <laughs> from our flyer, from our flyer um, definitely um, brings people in. And I think um, it, your personality is well suited um, to the role that you are, are playing and, and the contribution that you're making um, within a global space. Well, thank you so much. I feel so appreciative that I got to be on this show and to get to talk with you because I of course know that the work you do is so important and I love it that you're expanding that out into your nonprofit and creating a platform for this kind of message to get out and um, yeah and just in, and thank you to the listeners for taking the time to listen to this and you know and for all of us just to move forward in whatever aspect it is that we about which we are passionate and and to make that happen. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I want to um, wish you well as you continue in your role as National Geographic Explorer. Um, I will, of course, be following you, Maria. <laughs> I follow you around <laughs> on social media. <laughs> um, so you know that I'll be, you know, there watching you. Um, I appreciate all that you're doing. And I do hope that we can collaborate in producing um, a, a product um, for preservation of heritage knowledge. I wish you all the best, Maria, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>